So with the discovery of restriction endonucleases and ligases and taking into account an experiment that was done years and decades prior to that uh, 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 experiment on transformation, we now had the ability to um, do something called molecular cloning. Now, molecular cloning is not organismal cloning. This has nothing to do with uh, um, making a clone of a sheep or, or, or something like that. This is instead cloning a fragment of DNA, making lots and lots of copies of a fragment of DNA. Now, why is that important? Well, as a molecular biologist, you are oftentimes interested in studying a specific human gene. The problem is, is that a typical human gene is about 3,000 base pairs. The human genome is 3 billion base pairs. So trying to study a human genome, or excuse me, a human gene in the context of a human genome is trying to like studying a, um, a needle in a haystack. Okay. So what molecular cloning does in a, in a nutshell here is it first allows us to simplify the background of the DNA that we're interested in studying. So let's say this is on the left here, this is the human genome. In red is the gene that we're interested in studying. So the first thing that molecular cloning allows us to do is cut out this human gene and insert it into a more simple background. And so what we have here is called a recombinant plasmid. We have recombined this, this um, simple background here is oftentimes from bacteria. So we have recombined bacterial DNA with human DNA. Okay, that's why, that's why this is oftentimes called recombinant DNA technology. And I don't know if you hear that term very much anymore, but that's the origin of that term because we are recombining DNA from two different organisms. Now, that was the first solution, is that we've simplified the genetic background of the DNA that we are interested in. Okay, we no longer have to study it in the context of 3 billion base pairs. But the problem is, is we only have one copy of it. We only have very, very few copies of it. And in, to do any real study of this DNA, we have to make lots and lots and lots of copies of it. So what we do is we then put this into a host organism that will then replicate it over and over and over again. And now we amplify that DNA fragment. We have lots and lots and lots of copies of it. So how do we do this process? Well, the first part of the process depends upon that simpler background, depends upon what are called vectors. Now, there's lots of different vectors, as we'll see in the next slide, but the one that we're going to primarily look at and use, and the one that's used within the paper, are plasmids. Okay? And plasmids are circular DNA, about 5,000 base pairs or so, that have three absolutely essential characteristics necessary for them to work as a vector. The first is they have to have something called a polycloning site. Now that's going to be an area of the plasmid that has a lot of sequences to which uh, restriction endonucleases cut, or at which restriction endonucleases cut. That's where you're gonna be inserting your um, DNA insert. Then a plasmid needs an origin of replication. An origin of replication is a sequence recognized by the host cells that says, hey, this is DNA that needs to be replicated. It's going to be recognized by the DNA polymerase of the host cell. And finally, each one needs a uh, selectable marker. Now we'll explain what selectable markers are uh, more detail in a moment, but basically it provides a way for us to know which cells have actually taken up this plasmid during the process of transformation. Now, as I mentioned, there are lots of different vectors and your book uh, details many of them. The differences between them is what the host cell uses. So yaks, yeast artificial chromosomes, the host cell all right, that you're gonna put that vector into is yeast. Whereas most of the other ones are bacteria, bacteria, and then even viruses are the host cells 
And these vectors, another way they differ is the size of the fragment, the size of the insert that they can take up. Plasmids can only take about 15 kb. Oops, that should, should be a b, not a p. 15 kilobases, so that's 15,000 bases. And then bigger and bigger fragments in these other vectors. But the ones that we're going to study, and the ones that I'm going to expect you to know, are plasmids. So the first thing we have to do is make a recombinant plasmid. And we use that same method that we did in that previous video when we looked at uh, restriction endonucleases and ligases. Is that we take our um, DNA that we're interested in, so let's say some uh, um, source of human DNA, and we cut it with restriction endonucleases. It looks like PVU2 here and ECOR1. And that liberates a particular fragment. We cut our plasmid, and here's our plasmid, we cut that plasmid with the same two enzymes. So we have the reverse complementary sticky end here, we've got a blunt end here, and we incubate our human fragment with our cut plasma DNA. We incubate that with DNA ligase, and then we end up with our um, recombinant plasmid, our bacterial plasma DNA with our human DNA insert. But at this point, we just have a little tube of DNA that has just a little bit of this we need a lot more of this recombinant plasma to do anything with, to do any real tests with. So how do we replicate it? How do we make more and more and more copies of it? Well, that's the job of transformation. So a long time ago, some scientists did some experiments where they showed that if you incubate bacterial cells that are competent, meaning that they are able to take up foreign DNA, if you incubate them in the presence of these recombinant uh, plasmids. And you have treated these bacterial cells with calcium chloride first and then heat shocked them or electroporated them, so treated them with uh, a current, electricity, then that will sort of shock them into, at a low frequency, take up foreign DNA molecules. So some of these, not all of them, in fact, most of them won't, but some of these bacterial cells will take up that plasma DNA. And then you take all of these bacterial cells and you plate them out onto an auger plate that contains all of the nutrients necessary for those bacterial cells to live. The question is, and the problem is, most of the transformation is a very rare process. So most of these cells will not have been transformed. So when you plate them out on the plate, it would be such a pain in the butt to find the cells that have actually taken up the plasmid. So there's a trick we're gonna use. And that trick is that selectable marker. Remember, that was one of the three important characteristics of a plasmid. And the selectable marker that is often used is ampicillin resistance. But as you'll see, there are other selectable markers, te tetracycline resistance and things like that. So ampicillin resistance, what is it? Well, the ampicillin resistance gene encodes beta-lactamase. Uh, beta-lactamase beta is an enzyme that breaks ampicillin down, degrades ampicillin. What is ampicillin? Ampicillin is an antibiotic that kills bacteria. Okay, so what we have then here is a gene that's only on the plasmid that encodes a protein that breaks down an antibiotic. All right, which means that any bacterial cells that have this gene can live in the presence of ampicillin because they have the ability to break it down. Now, these cells here, before transformation, they, were, they did not have that gene, right? That's an important aspect of this experiment. They were ampicillin um, sensitive. But if they were successfully transformed, they will have taken up the plasmid. That plasmid contains the ampicillin resistance gene, and that will make those bacteria resistant to ampicillin. 
So what we do is after the transformation, we put them onto a plate that contains ampicillin. And the only bacteria that will survive is the bacteria that were successfully transformed. They will hit that plate and grow and grow and grow and form a colony. Now a colony is made up of hundreds and thousands of bacterial cells that are all identical to one another, that all harbor this plasma. So I have two important questions here. What do we know about these colonies? Well, we know that they have the um, uh, recombinant plasma. What don't we know about these colonies? This is the important thing. Let's go way back here where we have incubated this with this, with DNA ligase. Well, it is sometimes possible, not in this particular experiment, but in other experiments where what happens if both ends were cut with the same enzyme? So here's a blunt end, but what happens if it was also cut with ECOR1? Then this would have the same sticky ends as this here which means the DNA ligase reaction could actually just cause this pl plasmid to ligate back on itself. So what we don't know here is whether the plasmids in these um, bacterial cells uh, include the insert or are just the plasmid that has closed back in on itself and don't include an insert, our foreign, day, foreign DNA of interest. So that's what we need to figure out next. How do we do that? Well, turns out we use a special type of plasmid. Okay, so now we're going back to our, our plasmid. We're going to assume now that we're going to be using a different one, one that is commonly used. And it still has um, the origin of replication. It still has the polycloning site. That's right here in the pink. And it still has our selectable marker to be able to figure out which bacteria actually took up the plasmid itself. But it includes yet another important gene. And right there, centered on the polycloning site in pink, is a gene called LAC-Z. Beta-galactosidase is the name of the protein that this gene encodes. And beta-galactosidase, among other things, is an enzyme that can turn XGAL, a colorless um, molecule, into a blue colored molecule. And that's important for a second. Uh, that's important, we'll get to it in a minute. So, when you insert your fragment, you cut right here, you break that LAC-Z gene in pink, and you insert your DNA of interest, this blue DNA here, into that LAC-Z gene. So basically what that means is if we have properly inserted our DNA of interest into this plasmid, it will have broken the LAC-Z gene. And the LAC-Z gene will no longer encode a functional protein. All right, so what does that mean? Well, when we then take this recombinant plasmid and we transform it, into bacteria, and then we plate that bacteria out. We're gonna plate the bacteria out now on plates that not only contain the nutrients for that bacteria to live, not only to contain ampicillin that will kill off bacteria that don't have the plasmid, but also it has XGAL. It has that chemical that beta-GAL can turn into a blue molecule. So I've got the big question here. You're gonna plate that out, some of the bacterial cells will be blue, some of the bacterial cells will be white. And the question is, which colonies do you pick? Let's take a look. Remember that beta-gal encodes this enzyme that turns X-gal blue. If you successfully transform, uh, excuse me, if you successfully insert your fragment into the LAC-Z gene, then it breaks the LAC-Z gene, which no longer makes beta-galactosidase, which can no longer turn X-gal blue, which means the colonies will remain colorless, will remain white. So those are the ones you want to pick because those are the ones that have the gene inserted, excuse me, have the foreign DNA inserted 
into the plasmid. You pick them. So at that point now, we're pretty much done. You pick those colonies. You inoculate liquid culture. You grow them up overnight. So now you have hundreds and millions of, of these cells. Each one of the cells harbors your recombinant plasmid. You spin those cells down uh, in, a, in a centrifuge. You then add specific reagents that lyses open the cells, that releases the DNA and holds on to the DNA. You wash that DNA to get rid of all the other cell debris, the cell walls, the cell, all the other organelles and RNA. And then you add some water and dissolve the remaining plasmid and purified plasmid DNA. And now you have a ton of plasmid DNA that you can use to do various tests. And this is called a mini prep. And at that point, we will move on to studying about cDNA and expression vectors, where now we're, we're taking these uh, vectors, these plasmids, and we're adding other characteristics to them to allow us to do other interesting things.